Uh, my name is Greg Penoyer. I'm the executive director of Image Journal, and we, in tandem with uh, Westmont College, are sponsoring today's uh, conversation with Malcolm Geit. Well, let me just quickly say that um, the mission of Image Journal is to foster uh, cultural and human flourishing through uh, the cultivation of the religious imagination. And we do that through a variety of entry, uh, entry points into our community, which has grown to about 13,000 in the last number of years. We're 30 years old. Our 100th uh, uh, edition came out in March. We're now at about 102, um, 103. Um, our journal is our flagship project. And uh, we don't write about art in here. We do art in here. Um, got uh, poetry and short story and uh, creative nonfiction. And in the last uh, few years, and particularly this year, we've enhanced the visual arts in here significantly. We now have full uh, four colors throughout, and so there's been a, uh, somewhat of a change in the production level of the journal this year. Uh, by the way, these are free for those who subscribe, and we have 40% uh, off subscriptions for students or faculty here uh, today if you'd if you'd like to sign up at the door. Um, and uh, if you do subscribe, you can help yourself uh, to a copy of the journal. We also do the Glen, which is a major workshop every year in Santa Fe at St. John's College. About 200 um, artists and writers and uh, filmmakers gather together and to study under those who are accomplished in their particular field. Um, we have a, one person at least who is there this year. And it's an extraordinary environment. The spirit of the place is vivacious and engaging. And uh, the production qualities of the things that come out of the various workshops are extraordinary. Um, there's much more I could say about who we are. And uh, I just wanted to give a brief introduction. ImageJournal.org is our website. And uh, there you'll find all the information you need know about us. But. I'm Paul Willis uh, of the English department here at Westmont. I want to welcome you, faculty, staff, students, and a good number of you from the larger community here uh, to hear Malcolm Geit. Uh, we're privileged to have him with us. The title of his presentation today is Poetry and Prayer, How the Poetic Imagination Can Enrich your prayer life. Um, Malcolm is uh, an English poet, uh, a singer-songwriter, an Anglican priest, and scholar. He'll be speaking for uh, a, a bit less than an hour, and then we'll have 15 minutes, maybe, of Q&A. If you have questions for him, we'll hope to be done by quarter of five or so. Really, our president, Gail Beebe, should be introducing uh, Malcolm, because uh, Gail has told me that he has four books of uh, Malcolm Geit's poetry on his shelf, uh, which is pretty good considering that Malcolm Geit has uh, three books of uh, <laughs> full verse. <laughs> you know, I think you have a couple chapbooks too, maybe he was counting those. Uh, I am meeting Malcolm for the first time. Uh, but we find ourselves adjacent in a recent anthology of Christian poetry, The Turning Aside, in which the poets are arranged by date of birth. <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell you which one of us is older, but you can decide who has the longer beard. <laughs> Malcolm Geit was born in Nigeria to British parents, uh, came to Canada at age 10, and thence to a British boarding school and on to Cambridge, where he got his BA and MA in English. Uh, and it was at Cambridge that he underwent a conversion experience and became confirmed in the Church of England. He got his PhD at Durham University, where his study of the 17th century poet and priest John Donne led him to consider his own call to the priesthood. Uh, Malcolm was ordained almost 30 years ago, and for most of the last 20 years, he has been chaplain and fellow of Girton College, Cambridge, focusing on the intersection of theology and art. 
Malcolm Geit writes clear and limpid devotional poetry in traditional forms, most notably the sonnet. Uh, I hope you'll be sharing many of those poems with us today. They are beautiful and moving. He has, as I said, three full volumes of verse from Canterbury Press, the first and perhaps best known of which is Sounding the Seasons, which goes through the church year. He's also a singer and guitarist, the front man for the Cambridge rock band Mystery Train. <laughs> he has described himself as a poet, priest, rock and roller in any order you like, really. One person in trying to describe him rhetorically asked, what would happen if John Donne or George Herbert journeyed to Middle Earth by way of San Francisco, <laughs> took musical cues from Jerry Garcia, and fashion trip tips from Bilbo Baggins, <laughs> and rode back on a Harley. <laughs> well, I don't see a Harley parked out on the driveway, but Malcolm, however you got here, we're glad you're with us. Please welcome to Westmont, Malcolm Geith. Thank you for that very kind introduction. And yes, I, I remember now that we, we were uh, uh, both in that, in that anthology, um, The Turning Aside. So I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Um, yes, I, 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 I've never been here before, so I'm, this, is, this is a thrill. Um, and what, what a beautiful campus you have. Uh, in my initial correspondence about what might be appropriate, I think we thought this meeting place of poetry and prayer as a particular nexus of the larger meeting of faith and the arts you know, might be, might be helpful. Um, I, uh, I wanted to deepen my life in poetry and become a poet long before I understood what an extraordinary adventure it might be to deepen my life in prayer. Uh, poetry uh, and some unexpected poets, not the religious poets, not just Dunn and Co., but actually earlier, uh, uh, earlier in my life, it was the falling in love with the romantic poets, uh, poets like John Keats that really opened a sense of awe and wonder and the numinous for me. Um, and, uh, uh, but I had, hadn't seen poetry and prayer as occupying the same sphere, let alone even the two spheres having some intersection. Um, but it was uh, a bit later in my life, um, uh, when I was beginning to think I might have a vocation to priesthood, but was at the same time earnestly trying to work through the vocation as poet and following as a kind of mentor and a wonderful guide the great, uh, late great Irish poet Seamus Heaney, uh, that I came across a line in a Seamus Heaney poem um, which proved to be hugely illuminating for me uh, and I think has been illuminating for others too. And years after this poem was published that I'm about to quote of Heaney's, I had the joy of meeting and getting to know Heaney a little and having some conversations precisely in this, in this area of intersection that were very helpful. So um, just to cut to the chase on what that line is, you'll get the context in a moment. Heaney writes a poem in which he remembers having gone to confession. And you know the bit, well, you may not know, but after you've, after you've said your confession and you, know, you've, you, ask, you may receive a penance, but you also ask for guidance you know, and counsel. And the piece of counsel that Heaney was given by a priest after his confession was read poems as prayers. And um, when, I, when I came across that line, it suddenly, I felt um, uh, what C.S. Lewis called the two hemispheres of my mind <laughs> coming together and coalescing a little. So I want to explore that. I want to give you a little bit of the original Heaney poem and then I want to uh, turn from Heaney to Herbert, George Herbert, the great um, 17th century uh, poet and priest who is very much a kind of mentor and role model for me, and uh, explore, uh, explore with you a, a poem of his which is conveniently called Prayer. So if you want to do poetry and prayer and you find a poem called Prayer, you think, ah, <laughs> the mother load, you know, I've got, I've got it here, you know, I'm going I'm to um, uh, mine this vein. And uh, that's what I'm going to do. And then, in conclusion, uh, particularly because I've had this request that I might read some of my own poems, I'm going to actually share with you some completely new poems, new in the sense that they haven't been published yet. But they're coming out in, in a book at the end of October, which is called After Prayer. 
both the whole book is called after prayer in the sense that it is that is after prayer it's seeking prayer it's seeking an understanding of what prayer is also happily some of the poems were written after praying <laughs> helps but it's also in a much more specific sense after following on from a poem called prayer um, so that's the um, the rough uh, outline and I've given you a handout which I, I hope you can see uh, so I'm going to begin by reading you the it's not the whole of it but it's an important part of um, uh, it's the opening of a poem by Seamus Heaney called Station Island 11. Um, so two things just before I read this. One is a bit of context about poetry and the other is a specific bit of context about, about this Heaney bit. Now, when I come before a group of people whom I don't know and they have steeled themselves that this is going to be poetry, <laughs> And it's, oh my goodness, what is this? I sometimes feel I, I need to perform a minor exorcism. <laughs> and I am actually my bishop's advisor on deliverance ministry, so I can do this. Uh, but no, the reason why is it is just possible that for some of you, there is, as it were, lingering on the shades and borderlines of your mind and your memory is the unrested ghost of a bad English teacher. <laughs> the kind of English teacher that made you think you could never know the answer. The kind of English teacher who turned the glorious invitations of poetry into a weird kind of cryptic crossword puzzle to which she only knew the answer. The kind of poet, uh, English teacher of whom the American, the Texas poet Billy Collins said, that all she wanted to do was to tie the poem to a chair and beat it with a hosepipe till it confessed what it meant. You know, um, whereas, says Billy Collins in that same poem, I wanted to put my ear to the murmuring hive of the poem and know what honey the innumerable bees of language were making. You know, slightly different approach to the poem, eh? Um, so, a kind of English teacher that tells you poetry is great and then sets learning or copying poems as a punishment. <laughs> Go figure. Uh, anyway, I, I'm, perhaps you weren't afflicted by such a person who made you feel inadequate and made you feel that your tender and quickening responses to those words were somehow ruled out of court before you'd had a chance to articulate them. I hope you didn't have such a person. But if you did, and if the shade of that person is lingering anywhere in the back of your mind and making you feel that this session might not be for you, can I just say to the unrested shade of that teacher, depart, go to the place appointed for you and never return. <laughs> so, so that's the bad teacher in detention and, um, and now it's playtime. So I, I want you to enjoy these poems and just relax and play with them. So, that's con general context about poetry, particular context about this. Station Island is a sequence of 12 poems written in the mid-80s uh, by the great Irish poet Seamus Heaney, still in the midst of the Troubles, um, not quite yet, even at the point where there might be a hope of the peace process, which did come, and of which, in some ways, he was a part. And, uh, uh, you know, an American president uh, coming over when the Good Friday Agreement was signed quoted Seamus Heaney. <laughs> at the signing of that agreement, you know. Well, there comes a time when hope and history rhyme. Um, so he was, it became part of that process, but in the 80s it was a very bad time. Station Island is, a, is an island uh, an, in Loch Dag in, in Northern Ireland, which is also known as Patrick's Purgatory, and it's a traditional place of pilgrimage. And people used to go on pilgrimage there, I mean regularly, still do, um, a three-day pilgrimage in which you would fast for three days and go around the stations or beds, as it were, and try and confess your sins and reorient your life. And um, Heaney's done this pilgrimage three times, as it happens. And um, he, he uses the, the whole process of that as a way of, in the poems, 12 poems, encountering, rather like Dante, in fact, he's deliberately modelling it on Dante, the way Dante, as he journeys through, through the, the afterlife, encounters significant figures from his own past and from the past of his city-state, deeply divided by internecine warfare, just like Heaney's Belfast was, in which he tries to open out and expose the roots of the evil, but also see how there might be the beginning of a cure. And that's what Heaney does on Station Island. It's his, it's his equivalent of Dante's Purgatorio. Um, and it's pretty dark, you know, it goes down and down and 
the poem which precedes, or the, a couple of poems before this one, is one about the, the funeral of a friend of, of Heaney's who then became a terrorist and who was then shot. And, you know, so the violence both ways, you know, it's, it's dark. And there comes a point where Heaney thinks it can't get any worse. And he says, my feet touched bottom. And he has the image of a ship that's been put over writing itself. And he begins to introduce images of recovery and renewal. And this, the penultimate poem, takes that a little further forward. The other thing you need to know is that Seamus Heaney was brought up as one of ten children in a Catholic family in Northern Ireland, so they were kind of a minority within the North, but part of what would be a majority of the whole island. His dad was a farmer, and they grew up on this farm in Derry, um, which was, um, uh, there was a river running near it, and there were also various wells. And Heaney has a poem uh, uh, in his first poem, which says, as a child, they could not keep me from water. And I love the old wells and the dark drops and the trapped sky and the smells of fungus and water. You can imagine his mother, you know, poor Mrs. Heaney, where's young Seamus now, you know, constantly jumping in puddles. So this uh, poem recalls a time when he must have been a very little boy, perhaps given a kaleidoscope, perhaps his birthday, and running around and having the idea, oh, everything looks different through my kaleidoscope. I wonder what it would be like if I plunge my kaleidoscope <laughs> deep in this butt of muddy water. <laughs> oh dear, the gift spoiled. And yet spoiled in a search for vision. And now Heaney, recalling having made confession, recalls that image. Let's see what he says. It's here, Station Island. As if the prisms of the kaleidoscope I plunged once, in a butt of muddied water, surfaced like a marvellous light ship. And out of its silted crystals, a monk's face that had spoken years ago from behind a grill spoke again about the need and chance to salvage everything, to re-envisage the zenith and glimpsed jewels of any gift mistakenly abased. What came to nothing could always be replenished. Read poems as prayers, he said, and for your penance, translate me something by Juan de la Cruz. <laughs> <laughs> and the poem goes on, I haven't given you this bit, but I'll give it to you. He said he talks about the monk for a bit, and then he says, now his sandal passage stirred me on to this. And then the poem suddenly goes into a translation of John of the Cross's beautiful poem, Although It Is the Night, written from within the dark night of the soul, you know, which begins, how well I know that fountain filling, running, although it is the night. That eternal fountain hidden away, I know its haven and its secrecy, although it is the night. Hear it calling out to every creature. It's a wonderful poem about even in the dark, feeling the fountain of light. And um, you can imagine, it must have been quite interesting to be the father confessor, to be the monk in this question. Like if you re suddenly realize you've got a world-class poet on the other side of the confessional grill, you must think two things. One, this is gonna take some time. <laughs> and two, maybe I can get something out of this. <laughs> So I don't know whether he just, it was because it was Heaney, he said, read poems as prayers and translate me something. And Heaney gives you in this poem and presumably gave the confessor this beautiful translation. Or maybe it was a deeper insight. Maybe he realized that everybody in their vocation have, has to understand that there is prayer in what they do. Maybe if it had been a plumber rather than a poet, there would have been something about do your plumbing as prayer. Recognize your prayer as plumbing, realize you're clearing blockages, you're enabling a flow of water, you're, uh, you know, restoring health and sanity to a house. You know, who knows? Maybe he does that all the time. But anyway, he had a poet. So he said, read poems as prayers. And um, Heaney goes on to, to translate the poem. But I want to look at this, this initial image. There's something about what he experienced in unburdening himself of his sin and accepting the forgiveness that is freely given in Christ and recognizing that the gift he thought 
He was perhaps abasing in some way, could be restored, which suddenly called to mind for Heaney this episode of the spoiled birthday present. And it's the as if, as if, that's the question the imagination asks for. As if the prisms of the kaleidoscope I plunged once in a butt of muddy water surfaced again, like a marvellous light ship. The sense of freedom and forgiveness in the Lord felt as though the muddied, silted kaleidoscope had been given back to him unspoiled. And although this is actually about, you know, uh, sin and, and forgiveness or about what the Catholics call the sacrament of reconciliation, be reconciled to God. God is already reconciled to you. You need to be reconciled to him. <laughs> you know? Um, you notice he doesn't use any of the traditional language of sin or depravity or, you know, absolution. In fact... When he's gesturing towards sin that has been confessed, what he actually uses is this extraordinary image of the kaleidoscope plunged in the muddy water, needing to be cleansed. And in fact, he broadens from it. He says, the monk then says, to, re to salvage everything, to re-envisage the zenith and glimpsed jewels of any gift mistakenly abased. Isn't that a beautiful and extraordinary way of understanding what sin actually is? A gift, mistakenly abased. And if you think about it for a moment, I don't, you know, I don't want to embarrass you by making you think about this for too long, but if you think fleetingly for a second or two about your own besetting sins, the ones you keep having to con you know, confess to God again and then you end up screwing up in exactly the same way, um, are they not related actually to your gifts? Are they not often shadows cast by, you know, if they're sins of indulgence, they're shadows cast by your having been given a warm-hearted and gregarious nature. And if they're sins of cold judgmentalism, they may be the shadows cast by your having been given a clear analytic mind and an ability to see things objectively and not be swayed by sentiment. Whichever your gift is, it's the abasement of your gift that, that your sin consists of. And that's why the problem with dealing with sin is so difficult. The way when you sometimes try to be really severe on yourself and, you know, extirpate forever your sins, you actually end up plucking up the very roots of your own gifts. Do you understand that? That's the point about the parable of the wheat and the tares, isn't it? That the wheat and the tares are growing so closely together and the disciples, typical zealous Puritans that they are, want to rush out and immediately pull up, pull up all the tares. But he says, no, 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 you're going to pull up the wheat as well, aren't you? Let's wait until two, let's, separating these two things is going to be a slightly more subtle process. So, uh, how is it that Heaney is able to come up with this beautiful image out of memory of the cloud that re-envisages for us this whole tired question of what it is that's flawed and broken and wounded in us and how we might bring it to Christ and how he might cleanse and renew it without using any of the language of Zion or any of the recycled religious cliches that can sometimes see, uh, seem so uninviting and unexciting, right? How does he do that? Well, he finds an image, a poetic image. His imagination suddenly produces an image which teaches us far more. I mean, I've teased out a little bit of it. Than we might otherwise know. So, Shakespeare got there earlier, needless to say. I mean, when Shakespeare is defining poetry in, in Midsummer Night's Dream, you may remember he says this about how poetry works. He says, The poet's eye in fine frenzy rolling doth glance from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven. And as imagination bodies forth the form of things unknown, the poet's pen turns them to shapes and gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. Yeah? Imagination bodies forth. Imagination is not there to be airy-fairy and flimsy-wimsy and disappear off into some vague, never-never land of rainbows and unicorns. I mean, it can do that. But the imagination is actually there to find the local habitat, the image that just gets for you, and finally brings into focus something you've been half feeling but didn't quite get. And you've been half wanting to be motivated by but weren't motivated by it because you couldn't see it. Because it was disappearing in your mind as an airy nothing, right? Then suddenly, oh, a little boy with his birthday present making a mistake and spoiling it. 
couldn't it be restored? Isn't that a beautiful image? For all of us, even as adults. And he in his experience of confessing and receiving forgiveness is the experience of that lost present, that mistakenly abased gift being restored. Now, we, we could say a lot more about this, and one thing I guess I want to say quite quickly is that um, it's not just individually that we have gifts and then mistakenly abase them. That happens to whole societies and cultures. And one of the things that I think has been a tragic aspect of our development in the West in the last, in the scientific and modern West in the last um, 300 years or so, has been that God gave us reason, which we use extremely well here, but he also gave us intuition and imagination and insights that come in prayer and faith. And they're like the two eyes that he's given us in our heads. But we have, as a culture, I think, mistakenly abased the imagination. We said, oh, that's just private, individual, subjective, that'll never teach you anything, what's the case? Just stick to the facts and what can be weighed and measured. Unfortunately, everything that makes life worth living is on the other side of the equation. Because you can't weigh love, you know, and you can't measure wisdom. You can measure knowledge, but you can't measure wisdom. T.S. Eliot, in the Choruses from the Rock, asked two pertinent questions. He said, where is the knowledge we have lost in information? Where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? Well, you can tabulate the lower end of that hierarchy, but you can't tabulate the top one. And we're now living in a culture where if it can't be weighed and measured and photographed, it's not properly there. But we can't live in a world of facile images and statistics. And all the deepest things that make us human, are actually, including our faith, are accessible by and through the imagination. The imagination is not about making up the imaginary. It's about intuiting the meaning of the real. Okay? So um, Heaney, in a radio interview years ago, was talking about what makes good art and what makes bad art and what makes a good poem or a good novel. And he talked about truth within, even if it's a made-up story, it has an internal truth and consistency. And in this interview, Heaney says, the faking of feelings is a sin against the imagination. Isn't that interesting? He puts fake on one side, but imagination on the other. Faking of feelings is a sin against the imagination. So, this single line in this poem, read poems as prayers, became a really important thing for me. It meant that I felt that my pursuit of poetry, all poetry, not just explicitly religious poetry, was feeding and developing and growing my imagination and enabling me to pray, be pray better. It was giving me the images with which to think and the images with which to pray. And that has been a constant thing for me. Eventually I wrote a book um, which came out, um, gosh, quite a long time ago, just about ten years ago, I guess, um, called uh, Faith, Hope and Poetry, which is subtitled Theology and the Poetic Imagination in which I was trying to make the case for the imagination as a truth-bearing faculty. It was an academic book, so I wasn't telling people how to pray in it. But I thought, I'd like myself to explore the relations between poetry and prayer. So um, I thought to help us do that, and particularly because I've said that um, one of the things the poetic imagination can do for you is to take things in prayer and about prayer and aspects of your prayer life which you haven't got a handle on, you haven't got a picture of, and body them forth in an image you really can see that helps you to think about them. Um, by the way, just a quick throwaway thing, that, that account by Shakespeare in A Midsummer Night's Dream of how poetry works, the poet's eye glancing from heaven to earth and earth to heaven, imagination bodying forth, the local habitation, the name, it took me years to realise. I'd enjoyed that since I was... I, I first encountered that speech in A Midsummer Night's Dream when I was an ardent 17-year-old feeling very isolated and frustrated in an all-boys boarding school. And then, happily, in that year that I emerged into the sixth form, the girls' school, the equivalent school, which was the girls, which had been on the other side of London, 
moved next door. <laughs> and of course, they were completely separate, and there was a big wall between them. Just like in, in the middle of that stream, there's a wall, you know, in between. Um, oh, that would, oh, thou, oh, wall, oh, sweet and lovely wall. <laughs> Show me thy chink to blink through with my eye. Um, anyway, it was all separate, except for drama. So the, the boys and the girls were allowed to mix under, under adult supervision whilst doing Shakespeare, you know, as though Shakespeare would make us safe. My goodness. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, unbelievably, the first play we did was a Midsummer Night's Dream. So I was in a Midsummer Night's Dream, and you know, you have to exercise your imagination here. I was young and slender and self-like in those days as a 17 year old, and I played Puck. So I had a wonderful time cavorting around as Puck, you know. It's the story of my life. You start as a young Puck, you end up as an aging Falstaff. But you know, that's how it is. However, so I played Puck, and there was a very beautiful girl playing Hippolyta, the, the Amazon queen. Um, with whom I fell in love in a sort of 17-year-oldish way. And I was really jealous of Theseus, <laughs> who gets to know it, you know. So I, I hung on every, you know, I was listening. Every time Theseus had a speech, I was saying, I could do that better. <laughs> so that speech, the poet is Theseus's speech. The poet's eye in a fine frenzy rolling doth glance from heaven to earth. From earth to heaven. So I've known that speech well since I was 17, right? And I'm now 61. But it wasn't until I was in my late 40s or early 50s, having known that speech all that time, when I was beginning to think about faith, hope and poetry, beginning to think about how poetry and prayer came together, beginning to think how my passion for Shakespeare and my passion for Christ and, you know, for the Gospels and the Bible might come together. It was only then that I suddenly saw a blindingly obvious thing that I should have seen long before. This thing about the way Shakespeare sets this up, heaven, earth, earth, heaven, how are we ever going to connect them? What can possibly link them? Could there be some kind of embodying from heaven into earth? What would that mean? And I suddenly realized, man, he's riffing on the prologue of John's Gospel here. If you think about this, think about the beginning of John's Gospel, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was with God in the beginning, all things were made through Him. It's great. I mean, you know, like you read that, you know, like, wow, this is deep mystical stuff. But you can't actually see it, can you? It's just like Logos, in Arche, Logos, in its kind of... And then suddenly, verse 14, and the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And when he comes down, he, you know, all that is God is all the, the inapprehensible, the heavenly, the invisible, the fleeting glimpses, you know. The thing that everybody else would have wanted to dismiss as airy nothing in your life is suddenly a warm-blooded living human being who loves you enough to open his arms out on the cross for you. That's the word made flesh. And it's all there in the beginning of John's Gospel, because you remember, um, they start to get these glimpses of Jesus and see and somebody goes and finds Nathaniel and um, says, oh, we found the Messiah, you know. And they say, well, who is it? And it's Jesus of Nazareth. And Nathaniel goes, Nazareth? <laughs> like, Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? <laughs> it's kind of like, really? Um, and they say, people, they say, come and see. Come and see. And he goes and he sees. And you remember... Jesus says to him, do you say that I'm the Messiah because you, I said you saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater than these, things than these. You will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending. And Nathaniel's going, I know this one. Ascending, ascending and descending on Jacob's ladder, right? Jacob who became Israel. Jesus is just called Nathaniel a true Israelite. But that's not what Jesus says, is it? He doesn't say you will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on Jacob's ladder, just like your ancestor Jacob. He says, you will see the heavens open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. It's a hidden I am saying. I am Jacob's ladder. I am the connection between heaven and earth. And indeed, he is the body and forth. So what do the disciples, the first question that the disciples ask Jesus in John's Gospel, in the Latin that Shakespeare would have known as well as the Geneva Bible. Midsummer Night's Dream, he wouldn't have known the King James Version because that wasn't until 1611, just saying. Uh, so, in Latin, the first question to Jesus from the disciples is, 
Magister, ubi habitat. Master, where is your habitation? And Jesus says, come and see. Yeah? Imagination bodies forth the form of things unknown. The poet's pen turns them to shapes and gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. And just in case we didn't get it, Shakespeare, who modestly said he had small Latin and less Greek, which means he had probably a whole lot more Latin and Greek than any of us have got, uh, would have also known, of course, that the Greek word for a maker, when it says all things were made through him, is poiein, to make. A poet is a maker. You know, when Paul says, you are God's handiwork, he actually, the Greek word is poiema, you are God's poem, speaking into being. So I just think, quietly, Shakespeare was riffing on all of that. And going, you know why we can do this thing? You know why it is that we who are made in the image of God want to make poetry and want to body forth things and do so successfully? Because Jesus did that. God did that in Christ. And Christ then did that for us in the parables. We always taught with images. So, maybe the poetic imagination can help us in our prayer life. Because maybe we can... Um, we can get a sense of the, the mysterious things, the things we don't quite have a handle on, body forth. Well, it happens that the poet George Herbert wrote a poem called Prayer, which I've given you here, which is a sonnet of For My Love, and as you've kindly mentioned this, I've been, I've been trying to revive the sonnet and show that just as it was a beautiful and flexible uh, instrument in the 17th century, 16th and 17th century, it can be again now. It doesn't have to be contrived. It doesn't have to be full of quoths and doths and, you know, inverted syntax. But there's something about the concentration of the sonnet that's very helpful. So, um, George Herbert wrote this sonnet, Prayer. But although it's a sonnet, it isn't even a sentence. It's 14 lines, that's what a sonnet is. I am a pentameter, certain rhyme scheme. But he doesn't, he doesn't um, make a statement. He kind of takes out from the treasury. You know, it's like the things old and things new. He, he pours before you. He lays out and arranges before you. Or perhaps cascades into your mind. A series, in, in 14 lines, a series of 27 different bodyings forth, different emblems or images of what your prayer life is or could be. And he covers the whole range of what it's like to pray. Stuff you're doing now, and stuff you'd like to do, but you're not quite sure how. He's mapping it all out for you. He's kind of giving you the menu and the courses. It's an astonishing poem. And so I'm just going to read it to you now. And I'm going to say, let it just cascade through your mind. Enjoy it. And if there's one image that you go, whoa, what was that? I'm interested in that. Or, oh yeah, I recognize that. That's me. Then stay with it. You'll see images of great beauty and feasting. You'll have images of the mysterious and the exotic, like the spices. You'll have images that are actually beautiful and blissful. But you'll also have images that are about pain and hurt and anger and feeling like you're at war with God and being baffled by God and wanting to hit back at God. There are images of being exalted right up and there are images of being plunged right down into the depths. It's all there. Just 14 lines. Um, so, Prayer by George Herbert. By the way, there's no verb in this. It's not even the verb to be. It's not like he goes, prayer is this, and prayer is that, and prayer is the next thing. It just goes, prayer, and then you have to assume the verb to be. Right? So, prayer, the church's banquet. Okay, it's the banquet. Angel's age. It's angel's age. God's breath in man. You see? The verb to be is implicit throughout. Okay, prayer. Prayer. The church's banquet, angel's age. God's breath in man returning to his birth. The soul in paraphrase, heart in pilgrimage. The Christian plummet sounding heaven and earth. Engine against the Almighty, sinner's tower, reversed thunder. Christ, side-piercing spear. The six days world, transposing in an hour. 
a kind of tune which all things hear and fear. Softness and peace and joy and love and bliss, exalted manner, gladness of the best. Heaven in ordinary. Man well dressed. The Milky Way, the bird of paradise, church bells beyond the stars heard. The soul's blood, the land of spices. Something understood. Isn't that an astonishing poem? It's just amazing. You know, speaking for a moment as it were professionally as a poet, you know, everything turns on images and metaphors in the end. You know, if you haven't got a rich image, you, have, you really can't go anywhere. And you could spend a long time sitting in the hut at the bottom of your garden or wherever it is you write, waiting for a good image, you know? And you can go weeks without one. And then you finally get a good one and go, yes! I could squeeze at least three poems out of this one, you know. <laughs> and Herbert gets 27 absolute gems, and then he just gives them all away in one poem. <laughs> and goes like, you do the maths. You know, it's kind of like, you can start this off. It, 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 it reminds me, there's a great story about, I, I've not been able to track this interview down, so I don't know if it's an apocryphal story or not, but there's a story about uh, an interview with Bob Dylan, about his song, um, A Hard Rains Are Gonna Fall. So, um, you know, what did you see, my dear light son? What did you see, my darling young one? So you have this extraordinary set of images in that poem, right? I saw a highway of diamonds with nobody on it. You know, I saw a young girl, she gave me a rain rainbow. I saw a white man, he walked a black dog. You know, I saw one man wounded in love. I saw another man wounded in hedge. You know, amazing images. A highway of diamonds with nobody on it. So the interviewer says, they're all pretty astonishing, but you kind of give us them and then you don't... Why, why did you get that amazing cascade of love? There's these, all these inviting lines that you know, so disparate. And um, Dylan said, well, I wrote that poem over the weekend of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I really wrote that song. And I really didn't know whether there was going to be a world next week to sing songs into. But I was a young songwriter, and I had all these songs I knew were budding and bursting in me and waiting to be written. So he said, I, I figured I'd just write down as many first lines as I could. <laughs> <laughs> and if you revisit that song, it actually makes a lot of sense. And I feel that way about this poem. I feel that each of these images is an invitation to you to open up and you know, find what's being said. So what I want to do is, <coughs> just for a minute, you know, pick out, um, pick out a few of them um, to open up with you in prose wise, and then I'm gonna. So I, I've been, I've been, um, I've been using this poem not only for my own personal devotions and reading this poem as prayer and about prayer for many, many years, but I've also begun to lead retreats um, about you know, enriching our prayer life. And um, I've said to people, you know, maybe, maybe each of these, these images could be the beginning of something for you to explore. Or maybe it's like a map, and you're in the land of spices, great. But maybe you're the Christian plummet plunging down. <laughs> Where are you in this poem? Where would you like to be? But eventually, having said to people, you know, you could use any of these images as a start of a new poem, I was on retreat myself in May of last year, and I suddenly thought, you know, maybe I should take my own advice. <coughs> and I began to write sonnets responding to each of these um, images, and eventually I completed the whole sequence, and that's what's coming out later. So having teased these open a little bit with you in prose, I'm going to read you some of the poems that go with it. But let's just start with the, the obvious beginning in this poem. Prayer. The church's banquet. It's an interesting idea, isn't it? To think of your prayer as a banquet laid out before you. So it's quite large. Just if you think about what a banquet is for me. You know, um, a banquet is a shared meal for a start, isn't it? So you're in company with others. You're never actually praying alone. Even if you don't get, you know, the saints are praying, crying out how long the angels are, are, are singing holy, holy, holy. 
we join our prayers in the communion of the saints. Somebody's praying for you already now while you're praying for somebody else. So you kind of just sort of share things. And of course, the great thing about a banquet is that it's not, it's not a quick snack, is it? And it's not, you know, kind of junk food and it's not. But actually, it's a beautiful banquet which somebody else has prepared. And one of the great things about a banquet is not only has somebody else done the cooking, but somebody else is going to do the washing up as well. <laughs> so that's good. So if there is work to be done in prayer, most of that labor has been done for you. Jesus has done all the heavy lifting. Literally, lifting the weight of the world in order to be your connection with the Father. You know, so, so somebody else has prepared this, you know. And of course, the great thing about a banquet is it's got many courses and immense variety. And if you're really lucky, it's the kind of banquet where they put a little menu on the table first and you get the pleasures of anticipation and you see what the wine list is and you think, oh, you know, that's going to be nice, this little amuse-bouche. And, you know, it's been carefully worked out. So that if there's been something fairly thick and creamy, you'll get kind of a cervic sorbet fruit thing, you know, immediately after it's just to cleanse your palate before you plunge into the next thing. You know, so um, you have the menu. And some scholars have said, actually, the reason why he puts prayer at the church's banquet as the opening line is, the poem is the menu. You've got another 26 courses to come. <laughs> and here they all are. And some of them are are beautiful, gentle, subtle things, but some of them are, you know, really deeper. Some of them are, are spicy and alluring, like the land of spices, but some of them are sharp and difficult, Christ's eye piercing spear, you know. So that's one way of thinking about it. Uh, it's a, but of course, he, Herbert is not just thinking about secular banquets. I mean, he knew enough about that. His mother was famous for her hospitality. Uh, Maudlin Herbert. She was a brilliant woman. She was one of the great intellects of her age. And she had a circle of poets who came um, round and gathered round her table and at her feasts, chief of whom was John Donne, um, who took an interest in the young Herbert. It's pretty cool, actually. If you want to be a poet, it's quite useful to have John Donne hanging around with your mum a bit, you know, <laughs> giving you a few clues. Um, so, you know, they became friends. So, so he knew about secular banquets, but I think Ch Herbert, Herbert is deeply soaked in the scriptures deeply soaked in the scriptures. When he went up as a schoolboy to Westminster Abbey, uh, to the school attached to Westminster Abbey, Westminster School, which is still going. In those days, the Dean of Westminster Abbey was the person who was at all in the school. And luckily for her, it just happened to be Lancelot Andrews, mm -hmm. who was the guy who was given the gig by, by King James to s oversee the whole of the authorised version in the Hampton Court Conference of 1602. So um, he was the great Hebrew scholar of his day, but also had Greek and Latin. And all this stuff. In fact, he knew so many languages. When, when Andrews died, the bishop who preached at his funeral said that he knew so many languages that he could have served as interpreter general at the confusion of tongues. You know? <laughs> uh, so uh, he taught Herbert his Bible studies, and he taught him Greek and Hebrew. So Herbert knows his Bible very well. and. Um, uh, he clearly understands that to speak of our prayer life as an invitation to a banquet is to enter deeply into one of the richest themes in scripture, you know, from the, the covenant meals and particularly, obviously, um, uh, you know, the feast of the Passover, but also the covenant meal on, on the mountain when, uh, when, when, when they share uh, um, the meal there on the side of the mountain and the blood is put on the words of the covenant. Um, through to, obviously, the deepest teachings of Jesus, in which he constantly refers to the kingdom as a feast and the wedding feast and a gathering. So uh, there's all of that, and that's picked up later in the, um, in the line Exalted Manor. So there's just one image, just, just picking out. I'm going to just pick two or three, and then I'm going to read some poems. So Church's Banquet, good opening. Um, God's breath in man returning to his birth. That's a really interesting line. I love that. Prayer is, remember, just in brackets, prayer is. Prayer is God's breath in man returning to his birth. So, of course, because he studied with Andrews, Herbert knows that in the scriptures, the word ruach in Hebrew and the word pneuma in Greek, so the Old and the New Testaments, words which we sometimes translate as breath, are also the words for spirit and for wind. They're not separate words. And the, the spirit of God moved upon the face of the deep. Um, but also 
in the Genesis account, when God makes the human being, he breathes down and breathes the breath of life into him. The pneuma, the spirit. In that great conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus, which we translate, um, Jesus saying, you, you hear, you, you, you know that the wind bloweth, and you hear the sound thereof, yet you know not whence it come or whither it cometh or whither it goeth. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. In the Greek of John's Gospel, the word is the same word, pneuma. You could equally translate that, the Spirit bloweth where it listeth, you hear the sound thereof. So is it true of everyone who is born before the wind. How could the wind not be the breath of God? How could you breathe a breath without knowing that God is putting his spirit into you? But that particular sense of pneuma is really vital because Jesus takes that on. Jesus, in the New Testament, Jesus is clearly understood as being the second Adam. As in Adam all die, Stephen's in Christ, all we made alive. That in a sense, in the first human being, God, the birth of being human, that first breath, God breathed into us. And then it's Jesus who takes that breath and breathes it back to heaven. Into your hands, O oh Lord, I commend my spirit, my pneuma, my breath. And then, of course, he breathes. Mm. Now, I think at the end, in the resurrection, I think there's something extraordinary going on here. God's breath in man. Prayer is God's breath in man returning to his birth. When you pray, you're letting God breathe in you and you're breathing back to him. But in fact, if you want to, you can engage, you can enter into, you can enact and inhabit the whole story of creation and salvation in a couple of breaths. You know, you can do this while you're standing by the side of the road waiting for your Uber, you know, if you've got nothing better to do. You can breathe in and you can go, goodness, I've just been created. Uh, this is extraordinary. I'm standing here. I didn't make myself. Thank you, Lord. You've breathed your breath of life into me. Good. I appreciate that. And then now you're going, wait a minute. What do I do with it? I've got it in here. I'm going to have to let it go. But that's scary. What if it's my last breath? What if this breathing out there, one day, like, can I trust this thing I've been given back to anyone? And suddenly, just as you were there in Adam, now Jesus is standing beside you with his arms out on the cross saying, do this with me together. <sighs> Into your hands I commit my spirit. He takes my breath and gives it back to its birth, where it came from, from God. You know, people sometimes say about Holy Saturday after Jesus had died on Good Friday, but before the joy of Easter Sunday, that I've heard a preacher describe it as a time when the earth is holding its breath, right? Which is, yeah, that's good. But I think it's quite true. I actually think it's a time when heaven is holding the earth's breath. He's breathed it all back. And then Jesus is risen. And what does he do in the evening of that first day? He gathers them round in that upper room. And he breathes on them. It says, receive the Holy Spirit. This time it's not the breath of bios, the biological life. It's the breath of Zoe, the life of the Spirit. And you know that John's Gospel is just one long riff on Genesis. You know, it's the beginning of the word. You know, opening lines are a bit of a clue there. You know, and so of course there's got to be this moment of new creation. So you could, if you liked, waiting for your Uber, go... I've been created. Oh, I trust my life to Jesus. Jesus takes it into the heavens. Now, my second breath. I've received the breath of heaven. Job done. Thank you very much. You know, <laughs> two breaths. That's what prayer is. God's breath in man returning to his birth. I mean, it's astonishing. Uh, it's all there in just one line. And you could go on with these other things. Let me just pick one more before I go into some of the poems because time is running out and I want to be able to hear back a bit from you. Um, the soul's blood. That's an interesting one. Prayer is the soul's blood. So, what does that mean? Well, I guess you have to think he's saying prayer is to the soul, what blood is to the body. Now, you start thinking about that, it becomes really interesting. Because you think about, you think about all the stuff we do to make sure, I mean, I'm saying I do it, I'm not Mr. Healthy here, but you know. Uh, there's all these people kind of doing aerobic exercise and, and you know, trying to not be anemic, you know, trying to keep the blood circulating, keep the heart going properly. You know, you want to keep the blood circulating well so that the body can be healthy. And people, do they do that for prayer? Yeah, maybe not. You know, maybe it's not quite the same thing. I'm going to do some prayer exercises that I can 
you know, if you don't have enough iron, you know, you're a bit anemic. In fact, he's probably riffing on, um, not so much on contemporary medicine as on the line in, um, in Leviticus, uh, the blood is the life. Um, prayer is the life of the soul. It's natural that the ancient Hebrew people felt blood to be life because when you had a living thing and then you cut its throat you know, in a sacrifice and all the blood came out, funnily enough, it died. So you're going, like, oh, right, so where was the life? It's here in this stuff. Which is not a bad thing to say, actually. And the kind of offering of life. The blood is the life. Prayer is the very life of the soul. But there's another sense, if you think about it, most of the time we're not aware of our blood. I mean, you know, we, it's hidden. It's going on inside, the heart is beating, we're doing it, you know, we forget about it. It's only when we get hurt, blood comes a little bit to the surface in a bruise, and then sometimes it spills right out if we've been cut. Then suddenly it's there and we're aware of it. That is so true of prayer. Lots of people who don't know what prayer is and don't think they know it, you know, as soon as something really horrible happens in their life, they bleed prayer. <laughs> and suddenly you know it's there. And you do something about it, something with it. The soul's blood. So, um, I can't say this better in poetry than in prayer. So what I'd like to do, just briefly before we have a little bit of time for some, some feedback, is to read you a few of the poems I wrote in response to this poem. Um, I, I'll, I'll do some uh, put in poetry things I do, but I'll do some, some other nuance. So the opening, the church's banquet. This is my take on the church's banquet. Not some strict modicum, exact allowance, precise prescription, rigid regimen, but beauty and gratuitous abundance, capacious grace beyond comparison, not something hasty, always snatched alone, junkets of junk food fueling our disease, not little snacklets eaten on the run, but peace and plenty taken at our ease, not to be worked for, not another task, but love that's lavished on us, full and free, course after course of hospitality, and rich wine flowing from an unstopped flask. He paid the price before we reached the inn, and all he asks of us is to begin. So a little take on prayer at uh, the church's banquet. Um, At one point, he calls prayer the soul in paraphrase. It's really interesting, isn't it? That your soul kind of can't quite express itself. It's always trying to find one form or another of saying who it is and what it is. Paraphrase is an interesting word. Um, and I just wondered, since Herbert made this beautiful listing poem, whether I could have a go at a listing poem in which I try to figure out a few more paraphrases for the soul. Same image is budding forth. So this is my listing poem on the soul in paraphrase. A fledgling hidden in an ancient tree, singing unseen and darkling to the stars. The fountain spring of meaning, just upstream of every utterance, unsullied, free. A prisoner who grips and bends her bars. The one who begs to differ, dares to dream, a child astray, still calling to your heart. A pattern, personal as all the swirls in fingerprints on hands that hands have held. Wholeness that knows itself within each part. A flag whose emblem every breath unfurls. A chasm bridged and an old heartache healed. A new day at the end of all your days. A mystery you'll never paraphrase. Mm -hmm. So um, I want to talk a little bit just briefly about the way, the way um, he, he, in the middle of that poem, from a Christian plummet, sounding heaven and earth, down to engine against the almighty sinner's tower, reverse of thunder, how he kind of talks about the darker experiences. And I just, I think when he wrote Christian Plummet, he meant, um, you know, the plummet, which is like the lead line that you drop over the, you, with the, you, for sounding the depth of the ship when you're exploring. It's a good image of prayer. But I just love the, word, the juxtapositions of the word Christian Plummet. 
The plummet was the lead line, but also to plummet is to plummet down. I'm one of those people, as it happens, who does plummet down occasionally. I, I have, you know, reach up and I plummet down and I experience depression. And um, it's very difficult to do in some Christian contexts. Because people think that just because you're in that grief, you, you, you kind of don't believe in the resurrection. Of course you believe in the resurrection, but you can't articulate it at that moment. That's why there's more than one of us in the church. We kind of hold things for each other. Um, but... Uh, I just began to think about that image of the Christian plummet and the fact that there's somebody who's got their hand on the line and they're going to pull it up again, whether that might be helpful. So here's my poem on the Christian plummet. Down into the icy depths you plunge, the cold, dark undertow of your depression. Even your memories of light made strange as you fall further from all comprehension. You feel as though they've thrown you overboard, your fellow Christians on the sunlit deck, a stone-cold Jonah on whom scorn is poured, a sacrifice to save them from the wreck. But someone has their hands on your long line. You sound for them the depths they sail above, one who takes Jonah as his only sign sinks lower still to hold you in his love. And though you cannot see or speak or breathe, the everlasting arms are underneath. So um, I'm going to just finish, I think, by reading you, and then we can have a little bit of time for some feedback. Uh, for. Um, by reading you my take on his phrase, a kind of tune. Prayer is a kind of tune. It's lovely. Kind of music everywhere. So um, here's my take on that. A kind of tune. A kind of tune. A music everywhere and nowhere. Love's long, lovely undersong. A trace in time. A grace note in the air, born to us from the place where we belong, on every passing breeze and in the breath of every creature. All things hear and fear. For faintly, through our fall, we too may hear the strong song of the sun that undoes death. And one day, we will hear it unimpaired, the joy of all the sorrowful, the song of all the saints who cry how long, the hidden hope of all who have despaired. He sang it to his mother in the womb, and now it echoes from his empty tomb. Thank you very much for listening. Just if you'd like to. I've written down some things you might like to do at home in terms of, you've got the copy of the poem prayer, there's ways you could respond to it, different kind of creative things you could do with it, and a little example again of a poem of mine that's a listing poem. So I won't go into that now, but do take that home and see if that's helpful. Anyway, anybody want to come back on any of that or ask any other questions about poetry and prayer or faith in the poetic imagination? What's your absolute favorite poem? Oh, what's my absolute favorite poem? Oh, it's going to choose one. Um, I think Jared Manley Hopkins would be up there with Glory Be to God for Dappled Things, or maybe The World is Charged with the Grandeur of God, one of those two. Um, the poem which made me want to be a poet, and which still is the poem I, I return to when I want to rediscover what poetry is, it's not an overtly religious poem, but for me it always provides a kind of numinous experience, is Keats's Ode to a Nightingale. That movement from the kind of awful feeling at the beginning of, you know, my heart aches and a drowsy numbness pains my sense, as though of hemlock I had drunk or emptied some dull opiate to the drains one minute past and Lethe woods had sunk, which is pretty like dull drains, Lethe sunk, it's not going anywhere here, is it? And then, uh, you know, just a couple of stanzas later, you've got magic casements opening on perilous seas in fairy lands forlorn. He takes you out of yourself into this beautiful thing. So yeah, I would say um, for sheer essence of the sound of poetry, it would be the Ode to a Nightingale.
Uh, first, thank you. This was so inspiring. Uh, I love imagination and the idea of uh, roaming around in it for yeah. tangible. Yeah. That's so fabulous. To what degree, though, do we need to be cautious hmm. in how we assign some of those intangibles to things? Do we? How, to what degree can we trust our imagination? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So this is that's an important question. Um, Insofar as we think about the form, we realize that all our gifts are in some sense shadowed and slightly bent or right, but they can also be brought back to God. Now, I think a mistake was made around the time of the Enlightenment in thinking that imagination was somehow especially more fallen, but reason was totally okay. <laughs> but then we ended up with this tiny, narrow, logical rationalism, which has, in fact, led us astray. So at what's fallen is not so much each capacity or faculty, but the relations between them. It's the fact that they're not linked. It's the fact that we've made imagination only about the imaginary and then darkened our imaginations. So there are dark things. But then equally, we've made reason only about fact and not about intuiting God. You know, the person who really got this was C.S. Lewis, who in his last days of his atheism was kind of crying out for a reconciliation between imagination and reason, which eventually he found in Christ. <coughs> he has a poem, you know, that he wrote before his conversion, which, you know, goes something like, set on the soul's acropolis, the reason stands, a virgin armed, commercing with celestial light. He who sins against her has defiled his own virginity, no cleansing makes his garment white so clear as reason. But how dark imagining, warm, dark, fruitful, her pains along in her delight. You know, tempt not Athene, wound not Demeter in her fertile pains. And nor rebel against her mother right. And then he asks this question, he says, who will reconcile in me, reconcile in me, both maid and mother? Who make a concord of the depth and height? Who make imagination's dim exploring touch ever report the same as intellectual sight? Then could I wholly say and not deceive, then could I wholly say that I believe. It's the end of his song, written about three years before he actually did believe. And of course, we all know the story of how the pieces came together on that. One of which was that he loved the great stories of death and resurrection in the myths, but they were only lies, lies breathed through silver. And Tolkien said to him, they're not lies. And then can't you see that in Jesus Christ, the myths you love and the factual history that you respect and want to submit to come together in one? And myth is made history. And it, Lewis ends up bringing both his imagination and his reason to Christ. And find them. So, so yes, there is a there is a way the imagination can do, go wrong, and it has to be brought back constantly to its source and origin and cleansed. But it mustn't be simply cut off or abandoned, <coughs> because Jesus clearly appeals to the imagination in all his parables and teaching. Um, there's also a distinction between the deepest imagination and what Coleridge makes a distinction between imagination <coughs> and what he calls fancy. And fancy, he says, is just constructing your own private little fantasy. <coughs> he says it's just a mode of memory emancipated from time. So there is discernment to be done. But there's no doubt that... So Lewis, addressing this again in Surprise by Joy, uses the phrase, the idea of baptising the imagination. He says about reading George MacDonald before he became a Christian... Lewis says, I suppose in a way my imagination was baptised before I was. The rest of me just took a little longer to catch up. Yeah, and that's what I feel happened to me, actually, as an undergraduate as well. What's your favourite work by J.R. Tolkien? Mm. Well, I think, um, I think, I mean, I started with The Hobbit, like so many, but I think it's The Lord of the Rings. Um, I think um, there's a poem of his, uh, which is published in a book called Tree and Leaf, called Mythopoeia, or Mythopoeia, which, in which he sets out a lot of these very ideas, and in fact which he wrote to C.S. Lewis after this conversation, as a result of which Lewis you know, was helped to become a Christian. But I think The Lord of the Rings grows in stature with every passing year in terms of what it really says, yeah. You're obviously a musician, mm. and you quoted Bob Dylan yeah. fondly. Any musical influences? Oh, lots. How long have we got? So D Dylan is, Dylan is, um, you know, um, uh, very important to me. I mean, you might say I would, I would speak, I would say, you know, Leonard Cohen, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, Van Morrison and Neil Young, these are stars in the firmament, but Dylan is the firmament they're stars in. I mean, Dylan actually <laughs> creates the space in which they operate um, and remains great. I mean, that's been what's really interesting about Dylan is he's still producing, you know, good... I mean, he produces NAF work as well, but he produces great work late. If you think about a, um, an album like Time Out of Mind, um, in terms of the sheer lyric genius of that, you know, late in the day. Um, uh, so, yeah, he, he remains really vital. And I think he's still, I think he's a, great, a prophetic and a great religious writer, really. And I, although he stopped sloganizing in the explicit way that he did in the gospel albums, I don't think he's, I don't take the view that he's lost his faith. You know, on the contrary, I think it's still quite deep and quite clearly there. But he's one of the darker prophets, you know. I love the fact that when he got his Grammy Award, you know, that like everybody else is standing up there smiling in a way in a pasty smile and he's going and thanking their mum and dad. And then he goes like, my father once told me that a man might become so depraved and defiled that even in his father, m father and mother would disown him. <laughs> but when my father and my, ma my mother disown me, the Lord takes me up and teaches me the way, you know. Um, do you have any advice, Mr. Dillon? He said, work while it is yet day, for the night cometh when no man can work. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> I think we better call Yeah. Thanks again. Yeah.